Warning, do not listen to this podcast if hearing about freedom and liberty is not legal for you in your community. And if so, you should immediately move to a hipper community. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Podcast, a weekly web lab where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi cover the punk rockinist, hip hopinist current events, as well as timeless universal truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because there's no such thing as half free. The Freedom Fiends Podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Freedom Hour with Freedom Fiends Michael W. Dean. Broadcasting from my windowless bunker. And Nima Vidati. Go, go, Freedom Fiends! Rolling, you take some fuck and some shit and some fuck and some <laughs> shit. Gotta fuck shit stack. Yeah, this is the uh, Freedom Fiends, the cast where we don't cuss. Oh, oops. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I don't know. We don't know if we're allowed. That's basically. I kind of like that situation. We don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's it's but, plausible uh, deniability. We cuss sometimes and sometimes we don't. What is F S stack about? <laughs> Who is it? Oh man, what's the guy's name? Um. Pretty funny guy. He does this song called FS Stack. It's uh, <laughs> kind of a tongue in cheek takeoff on hip hop. Like he starts off going, word, adjective. <laughs> Got a little something for all my gerunds out there. <laughs> Um, sounds like it could be corny and white, but it's actually not. Dude's got a big fro, and it's pretty hilarious. Yeah, it's like, and it teaches you about English. It's like updated schoolhouse yeah, yeah. rock. But uh, his name's Reggie yeah. Watts, and he's amazing. I will, I yeah. will link that. And the beat is just him like uh, beatboxing, but I don't. It, it's not like he just beatboxed in front of a mic. I think they uh, sampled each of the different sounds and then played it back on probably an MPC or something like that. And uh, the instruments are him like humming and stuff too, so it's really cool. Well, actually, on on uh, Vimeo, Vimeo it seems like there's more Vimeo than YouTube of him. Yeah. Um, on Vimeo, there's there's some of him doing stuff live, and it's like he has a bun he has like a table full of effects pedals and stuff in front of him, and he does he loops that stuff loops live. It live, okay, okay, yeah. But a song like that, he probably looped it in the studio and then put it on a track on Pro Tools or Cubase. Oh or yeah, something. yeah, yeah. But he can do it live. Okay. Pretty cool. Sweet, sweet. Yeah. Score. Yeah. So what's up over yeah. there in, in Casper right now, Michael? Oh, there's a hostage standoff at the Motel 6. Oh, no. Are the police protecting you? If any... Uh, the Super 8. <laughs> Sorry, the Super <laughs> the 8 on Super CY. 8. So if anyone is listening out there live, uh, stay away from the area of CY and Wyoming Boulevard. Yeah. Maybe it's young Jeezy up in there cooking crack. I don't know what that is, but I found it kind of interesting that it's election day and there are election places over on that side of town and that whole side of town's locked down. So people can't vote, oh. which I don't care about. But, yeah. you know, I mean, if I were a conspiracy theorist, I'd say this was something manufactured to keep people in a certain district from voting. But who knows? <laughs> who knows? Now, usually these things, uh, they have some kind of warrant, usually a drug warrant, and they go to serve it. And then people are like... I'm not going to jail, and then they call it a hostage situation. I know. They're like, I don't want to go to jail. I paid for another hour in this hotel and for <laughs> and for this crack whore. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Get I'm my money's partying. Worth. I'm partying. I, I, I waved my high point, man. Get away from me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's a really sad situation, too, because the media always does it from the mouth of the cops. Um, I, I did a story like this where there was a, a live standoff or whatever, and yeah, it was just the cops out there, and there were like kids in the house, and they surrounded it by the SWAT team, and you know, if I had five of my kids in my house and the SWAT team pulled up, I, I would be in there planning on, on what the hell I'm doing, you know, and it wouldn't necessarily be a hostage situation, but I'd be trying to figure out how do I get people out of this thing without getting shot by the cops. Well, and what they want you to do, and the smart thing it would seem to do would be let the kids out, but then they're just going to take them and put them in with the state yeah, you know you're yeah. gonna lose your kids yeah they're gonna they're gonna be with cps or, or whatever the case is in your different locale yeah i mean 
I don't I don't know if this is a real like genuine emergency where somebody is being violent or not. There's no way to tell. Uh you know, I mean I, I kind of think about like when when papers report, you know, there's a demonstration and it turned into a riot. More often than not, it's a police riot. It's the police yeah. being violent, you know. Yeah. And it's really hard to tell in any situation with the state, but the thing we we all know is the state is violent. So any any kind of situation like this, you know, at least at the very least the state is being violent. So uh it is prudent to avoid those areas if you can. I watched this really interesting documentary last night called Urbanized, which is Part three of the trilogy, which contains the movie Helvetica, the one about the font that I saw. Ah. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's urbanized. Uh, well, well, for those who maybe are new listeners, what was Helvetica? Well, Helvetica is a font, and it's pretty much the most common font, especially with uh, states. You know, like your tax forms are in Helvetica. A lot of like signs on government buildings, not just in the United States, but all over the world, are in Helvetica. It's kind of a Fat, it's, the font. it's a fascist font. I mean, fascist it looks it looks yeah. really uh, commanding. Like it makes you want to mm-hmm. kneel before it. Um, <laughs> so this guy Gary Huswit, Huswit, who was the editor of um, God, what was the editor of uh, Salon Mag Salon dot com? Yeah, which is kind of a really lefty. Like I'm smarter than everyone else. Webzine, but it's they also are, but but Glenn they Greenwald got, writes they got for them some good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the the guy who runs that thing, Gary Hustwit, uh, did a three part design trilogy of documentaries: Helvetica, uh. Objectified, and Urbanized. Helvetica is about the font specifically, but it's more about uh, design. Um, Using graphic, design graphic to design. further your fascist desires. <laughs> well, basically, but he, you know, he's coming from a it's okay kind of thing, mm. and then objectified is about industrial design. And so he's he's more of a is, is it more of a how to then like, <laughs> kind of if, if you'd like to keep the slaves in check yeah this and, is how. and urbanized is uh is about urban planning which just had me and DJ going bah! throughout the whole thing. I mean, it kind of they interviewed people urban planners. First of all, these documentaries are stunningly photographed. I mean, they have great B-roll from all over the world, and they're great, yeah, uh, okay. beautiful to look at. But they had in Urbanized, they had interviews with urban planners from you know South America, Denmark, New York City, all over the world, and it was like I actually hated the New York City ones less than the the ones in South America and Europe. I mean, the one in South America, I forget which it was in um, Bogota in Colombia. And it kind of reminded me of that Parks and Recreation where they get the Parks and Rec Department from some... Colo- Venezuela. Venezuela. Their, their, their sister the, city in Venezuela. Yeah, visits them and they go they go with the, the American Parks and Rec Department to like a city council meeting and there's there's people standing up and saying, I don't like the dog poop in the park. And the guy from Venezuela is like, I do not understand. Where are, where are the soldiers to take away these loud, obnoxious people? <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of like that. It was kind of like, you know... We just do what we want and build a better Colombia. And then, you know, yeah. in Europe, it was a little softer. It was like, well, it has been democratically voted in that we will build this park and rape this forest to do it. And so we must. <laughs> and then in America, it's like, yeah. well, you know, there's all this like stuff from the 1920s and it's really ugly. And instead of tearing it down, we're sort of building around it and making it more modern. And, you know, we have to like go through some neighborhoods and evict some people, but it's okay. Uh, you know, and I'm not against urban planning. I'm against city, you know, state well, urban planning. Yeah, I mean, inherent in that that word or that phrase, urban planning, is it's being done by the violent <laughs> monopoly of the state. It's being done um, to you. It's being done to you, exactly. Not for you, although they would beg to differ. I remember talking to the public works, one of the public works guys back in Pasco, Washington, for a news story. And um, we were chatting a little bit after the interview because the guy was from Afghanistan and he spoke a little Farsi. So I said something like, hood office, when, when I was leaving. Did he uh, draw his sword and hold it to your neck? No, he oh, did Oh, wait, not. I'm sorry. I meant his... <laughs> That's racist. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but he was like, he was like, yeah, you know, come at me anytime for for any story ideas. You know, without civil engineers, we wouldn't have a whole lot of the stuff people take for granted, like water and roads. And he was kind of going on and on about that. And I'm like, well, that that may be true in the current paradigm, but if we had a stateless paradigm, then then we would have those kind of things from all sorts of different parties. Anybody who desired to make money off of people would would provide them with the things they want. So, what would civil engineers be called in Libpair? Just engineers? Well, yeah, because the, the word civil's there, and that kind of refers to state type of thinking. But maybe urban planners, or um, although I don't like the word planners either, but um, I guess road they, they would be more specialized. Road engineers, water engineers, infrastructure engineers might work. They did show in this design trilogy movie, Urbanized, they did show... Um, a bunch of protesters in Germany, which, you know, the whole thing seemed very kind of pro-urban planning, but they showed the other side of it. They showed, you know, some hippie anarchists and old people who liked the trees. I mean, a really interesting thing in this one place was uh, in this one park, um, you know, during the war, during World War II, when the Nazis were, you know, everything was bombed in this one area. Mm -hmm. And people were, like, starving and freezing to death. And they were, like, you know, burning their furniture for heat and there was this one park where they loved the trees there so much even though they were freezing to death they didn't cut down any of the trees in that park wow and wow. you know this urban planning thing was going to like bulldoze those trees yeah yeah well see that's that's another good point because some people say well you know what about national parks and wildlife preserves and things like that but there is a desire it, there's a market desire amongst some people to have those types of things preserved you know things that are for their heritage that was a decision of you know of people in the neighborhood it right. wasn't a decision of the state the nazis were out killing everybody they could they probably couldn't be bothered with what trees were cut yeah. down yeah it was an anarchic order kind of thing and i saw this too in hawaii it wasn't at the nude beach but um on on the way to the road to hannah or actually on the road to hannah because that's is the way um we saw a little thing assigned for a lava tube and we drove by <laughs> and it was a, a guy named chuck and he was a ron paul supporter he's on his way to tampa right now i'm guessing because he was telling me about that uh and he owned a chunk of this lava tube you know where lava spewed out of the ground horizontally and left a cave it was real beautiful and um he had bought it and developed it and it had rails and signs and it was just like you see at Carlsbad Caverns or any of the national caverns or state-run uh, parks like that. Um, and, you know, you paid him a little bit of money and you went in and, it, I mean, he was able to do it. Just just one guy who happened to own some land. He, they, there didn't need to be any state monopoly of force there. So is Hawaii a tube-based economy? It's a tube-based economy. <laughs> yes, it sure Do you know is. that tube is, um, is police slang for a shotgun? Get the tube. Huh. I could see that. Because, yeah, the barrel, it's not rifled or anything. So, yeah, it's kind of just like a tube. You, you missed the whole discussion of police slang that I had with Garrett while oh, you were yeah. gone. Like, uh, doing the funky chicken is being is on the ground being tased. Ugh. And Edison Medicine is taser. Get the Edison Medicine. He wow. needs some Edison Medicine. Wow. And uh, screen test is when you're cuffed in the back of a car and they slam on the brakes so your teeth hit the back of the seat. Ugh. Uh and one of the words that was really bad. Another one was um, gutter. God, what was it? Gutter something. Um, it was where police write you a ticket after you leave and then mail in their copy and then throw the, your copy on the ground so you get a warrant. What? You can get a warrant if you throw your copy on the ground? No, like, okay, they pull you over. They, you know, look look at your papers. They say, okay, have a nice day. Oh. Or say, like, you, arg you argued with them. You're like, hey, I don't have to give you blah, blah, blah. I'm flexing my rights. And you I drive up, and they say, okay, drive off, have a nice day. After you leave... They sit there and write you a ticket. Oh. They throw your copy on the on the road. Got it. Then, got it. Yeah. So you don't think you got a ticket. You think they right. just let you off. Yeah. Right. Man. Yeah, you know, it's sort of how um how Ruby Ridge happened. I don't know if it was accidental or intentional, but uh the whole thing was about a failure to appear um based on something they sent that had the wrong date. It, you know, they sent him something that said like you have to appear June 12th or something and it was really May 12th and when he didn't show up Wow. Uh, they went after him. Wow. Yeah, and I feel like there's a lot... I feel like when you deal with the state, you know, 
and most of us when we deal with the state, a lot of it is cops. You know, that that's one of our uh, the most ubiquitous examples of dealing with the the idiocy and the the malice of the state. Gutter gutter tag. That's what gutter it's called. tag. Okay, okay. Because I know whenever me and my wife deal with tickets or everything, it just feels like they don't want you to necessarily pay it. They don't want to make it easy for you, like a business would, right? It, it's hard to find the stuff on the website. Uh, you go to the window, they're like, no, it's not this window. You got to go to the window across the street, and then say, oh no, you. You, you were at the right window. You got to go back there. Uh, and then you try to give them a credit card, and they're like, oh, sorry, we, we don't take that. You try to give them a check. They're like, oh, money order only. Uh, I feel like they almost want you to not pay it on time so they can give you a warrant and extract more money it may from be, you. It may be unintentional. Ben Quaker did a whole, almost a whole cast on uh, usability of websites, and it wasn't just government websites. Right. You know, it's basically like small businesses – that are that provide a service and do really well and people like them generally have websites that are really easy to use. Um, governments generally have websites that are not easy to use, and corporations that are in the pocket with the government yeah. generally have yeah. have websites that are really hard to use and like things don't even work on them. And they're websites that are sprawling and really well good look look good, and they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on, and you can't find a phone number. You right, can't right. you know you click on something and it's four hundred four. Well, it's I feel like. Yes, it may be unintentional, but then there is a, a level of neglect there that you have that I don't think yeah, you would have yeah. in LibPair or a free society. Uh, the government can neglect you know, making it user-friendly because they don't care. It's not a, a high priority for them to make it user-friendly at all. So in that sense... It's not intentional, but uh, the system requires a sort of – or doesn't require, but enables uh, a level of neglect on their part that I don't think you'd see in a free society. Yeah. Fuzzy's on my lap. Ah. All our cats tried to secede from the rest of the house. How? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we've got three bedrooms, right? One bedroom shared by me and my wife. One bedroom um, is my wife's brother. The third is in name only the bedroom of my mother-in-law. But she doesn't really live there. She really lives with her boyfriend. Um, so instead, it has become a storage collector. It's it's all. She took all the stuff out of her storage and put it in that room. So you can't really walk into it. Like it's so cluttered. <laughs> a human can't, but cats can. And so all the cats have decided to make that their own little cat paradise, and they all <laughs> crawled in there, and none of us can get to them. Uh, so the cats have seceded. <laughs> Speaking of secession, to check your email, I just sent you something about the Vermont Republic. Did you know that? the state of Vermont seceded for like 12 years at one point. Everyone knows about Texas, but no one knows about Vermont. I used to know these, this punk rock chick I used to do back in the day who changed her last name to Vermont, Alex Vermont. Um, and she was in a like tribe of lefty anarchists who all had the last name of Vermont. And uh, their motto was, my name is Vermont and I do what I want. <laughs> and it was nice, based nice. on the fact that um, here you start, you read a little bit of that and out loud, and I'm going to go let Charlie in. Well, I, I know they have a, a separatist movement um, recently. I, I think they have a self-avowed socialist, Bernie Sanders, in Congress. I don't know if he retired or, or not, and I'm not sure if I got his name right. Um, according to the Wikipedia page for the Vermont Republic, um, it has been used by later historians for the government of what became modern Vermont from 1777 to 1791. Uh, in July 1777, delegates from 28 towns met and declared independence from jurisdictions and land claims of British colonies in New Hampshire and New York. They also abolished slavery within their boundaries. The people of Vermont took part in the American Revolution and considered themselves Americans, even if Congress did not recognize the jurisdiction because of vehement objections from New York, which had conflicting property claims. The Continental Congress declined to recognize Vermont, then called the New Hampshire Grants. <laughs> Overtures by Ethan Allen to the organizers to join the province of Quebec. Is that how you pronounce it? Or is it Quebec? Either. Quebec failed. Yeah. Okay. In 1791, Vermont was admitted to the United States as a 14th state. So does that just mean that they um, joined the Union late? Well, it sounds like they were, I mean, they had a constitution and they had their own money, uh, and they were from 1777 to 1791. Right. They uh, were independent. Right. But it doesn't sound like they seceded. You know, they, they weren't part of the union and they were like, fuck this, and, and left. They just joined late because they wanted to try to do their own thing. Yeah. The militia was the Green Mountain Boys, which uh, I've heard of. There's actually a libertarian um, 
blog from someone in Vermont, and okay. he's blogged us before called Green Mountain something, Green Mountain Boys. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I know Vermont does have, uh, I was talking about this when you left, Vermont does have an active uh, sort of separatist movement that there are people in Vermont who want Vermont to become independent from the United States. And I think that there's a little bit who want to become part of uh, Canada, of Quebec. Ah, ah, hmm. Yeah, yeah. Quebec is full of secessionists. I'm French Canadian, so you know it's in my blood. I'm not going <laughs> to secede. I'm not going to secede. I'm just going to sit here and watch things collapse. I thought you already co- had seceded. Your your, your <laughs> home, you and DJ have become the independent nation of Nestlandia. Now I don't want to. I don't want to say that in those exact terms because then when they're done down at the Motel Eight, they'll come over here. Right. Um, right. <laughs> we had to destroy a secessionist compound. <laughs> secessionist compound well there are there is an outbuilding so i guess this is a compound there's a there's a tool shed that you can ah. probably you know you can stand up in and hold your arms out to the side without touching the walls so is that the definition of a compound and there is a, a fence around the backyard so i guess it is a compound yeah two or more buildings uh a fence guns and you know someone that doesn't like the government i think yeah, that's a compound yeah, you yeah. Know? or you know a church a church led by a spiritual leader who, you know, has a beard and less than a million follow, <laughs> follow less than a million followers. If if you have if you ever get raided by the state in the news reports, they are going to talk about how many guns you had. Like it was a crazy thing. Like look at this crazy person. It's not California, and I don't have that many. I mean, in California, I'd have a lot. Well, but, you know. well, see, a, a lot of the news reporters there are implants from California or whatever. Implants. Big, They're in embedded statists. Yes, in, yes. embedded liberals. <laughs> yeah. He says yeah. I'm not there anymore to uh, read the scripts and be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know. I th- all of the news here is statist, but none of it really seems gun grabby to me. Yeah, you yeah. know, whenever there's a crime involving a gun, they're they talk about the crime. They don't talk about and That's there was true. a gun. That's true. That's true. You you're probably right about that. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, I helped the culture there at K two a little bit with all my pro gun stories. I don't know, man. There's a whole new crop of fresh faced youngsters from. California. Same news director, though. And I remember when I was there, uh, the news director, Jim, he was new. Like, he came on, he came aboard about uh, six months after I had been there. And um, my gun stories did help the ratings. So I remember sometimes he'd be like, why don't you go do a gun story or something like that, you know, if I didn't have anything for the day. Yeah. Well, I tried to pitch that story about the problems with the GOP here in the Ron Paul situation, and nobody wanted to touch it. Uh, and I watched them that night, and they did something literally about puppies instead, and then interviewed some <laughs> bureaucrat about you know why spending more taxes is a good thing. Mm-mm. Okay, was that the the state economist? I remember sometimes they'd have me go talk like once a month when the unemployment numbers come out, they'd want to, somebody to go talk to the the state economist or whatever. I don't know, but I do know that in that this is why I brought up that whole documentary, Urbanized. I wanted to point mm-hmm. out that all of the bureaucrats from every country. Uh, interviewed in it were really comfortable being interviewed, which leads me to think they're just on TV 24-7 telling yeah. the public why it's good that they're spending their money. Yeah. Well, here's one of the things that, that struck me as a f- inherent flaw in, in the mainstream media culture. Um, you know, when, whenever it's a government source, there's a lot less skepticism that, that goes into any interview. Um, and, and we tend to take them as being objective in some way. So if, if there was a government source saying something about the economy, you know, we would just take that as, okay, that, that's a more objective source. Whereas if it was some private economist or, you know, somebody that worked for some private group that studies but maybe has a contract with an industry like the housing industry uh, we would give that a lot less credence and sometimes they wouldn't even want us to interview them they'd, they'd say oh well well of course that's just some corporation that wants more profits so we can't talk to them if you're interviewing some guy who's made millions of dollars investing in gold talking about gold they're going to think that's weird but if you interview some guy who has a steady paycheck from money being stolen at gunpoint they're going to believe what he says <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much which i'm not saying that that you know the private economist or the person that's some spokesman or advocate for a different industry. I'm not saying that they're unbiased. They obviously are biased. I'm saying the problem is in the the fact that we view the government sources as being more unbiased than not because they they are obviously biased towards uh, all kinds of state action. Or if you interviewed me, who's going to be the Donald Trump of Bitcoin? Uh, we have one point. <laughs> we have one point one Bitcoin now. Okay, great. And it's one for the fiends and point one for the gumbo. Yeah, yeah. So 
You, you, Nima, have. Anyway, all right. <laughs> yeah, I'll split the Bitcoins with you 50-50. You have, point, <laughs> you have point five Bitcoins. I sent okay. you some money this week. That was cool, huh? Yeah, yeah, that was cool. Got some, yeah. got some Fiends money. Um, all our expenses are paid off, so. Send more Fiends money. Subscribe. And... Uh, <laughs> Torrent. We have uh, there's a little link over on the right now, a little green link on the Freedom Fiend site. It says Freedom Fiends Torrents. Please seed, and we'd like you to all download all of our stuff and seed it. That will help in case we're droned. Yes. And yes. Uh, let's take a break. Okay. Hi, I'm Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends, and like you, I'm concerned with privacy on the internet. The electronic police state is strangling our previous protections, and the central scrutinizer is trying to squint into all areas of our lives. That's why smart people surf the net with a VPN or virtual private network. I use a VPN from Bola VPN. Bola VPN has your utmost security in mind and will allow you to surf, email, and do other computing tasks without leaving a trail of breadcrumbs across the internet. Unlike many other VPN providers, Bola VPN doesn't log traffic. With Bola VPN, you can change your apparent location or disappear completely. Bola VPN has been around since 2007, which is OG in the VPN world. Bola VPN is easy to install and configure. Best of all, it can be had for less than 25 cents a day, which is a small price to pay for this much security. And if you open a support ticket saying you heard about them through the Freedom Fiends, they'll add three extra days free. That's Bola VPN at B O L E H V P N dot net. Check out the Anarchy Gumbo podcast. Michael W. Dean of the Freedom Fiends cooks up a very special blend of liberty, guns, sex, rock and roll, drugs, and thriving in spite of the state in an increasingly worrying world. All with a rotating cast of nifty guests who are also up in the middle of the night. The Anarchy Gumbo Podcast, a tasty stew of freedom and fun. Subscribe at kittyfeet.com. That's K-I-T-T-Y-F-E-E-T dot com. Rolling. Rolling. So I'm enjoying a a cigarette, a fine cigarette. How about you? Uh, no, I'm still downloading nicotine directly to my lung drive via the Vaporsmith's pass-through, um, but I'm not being paid to say that anymore. <laughs> yep. Uh, there was a comment on our, uh, on our last episode from Wade who said, not surprised that Vaporsmith stopped advertising on The Fiends. I'm sure I'm not the only one that could hear MWD lighting cigarettes in between <laughs> in between ads where he says he only uses Vaporsmith's electronic cigarettes. Well, he could have been lighting a candle or a joint or some incense. <laughs> I, uh, God, I don't like incense or joints, and okay. candles are dangerous around cats, so no, none of that. <laughs> uh, I'll actually address this since someone brought it up and several other people have. Um it's more the other way around. I was smoking cigarettes because, and I don't want to bash Vaporsmiths. They're a good company, and we had seven months of great relationship with them. But um, they're having real problems keeping stuff in stock. And uh, so when you heard me smoking, it was when I was waiting for 10 days on my delivery. Uh, I wasn't going to sit around and not do nicotine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the point of nicotine. Got to always have it, right? <laughs> yep. So um, we had an amicable separation with them. And uh, they've moved on, and we've moved on. Uh, their, their ads are still going to be in our archives. I'm not going to go through and edit them yeah. all. And that's part of the relationship and the deal when you advertise with The Fiends is that your ads will always be there. Yeah, yep, exactly. You know, exactly. So, so even it, once the relationship ends, anybody listening to the archive will, will still get it. So it's kind of a nice long tail of advertising, even after you've stopped paying. It's kind of like, yeah, good good term. Good good uh, terminology of the marketing wording. Yes. Um you know, it's kind of like if you broke up with a girl, but you'd still be willing to tell other guys, she's a good lay. Try her out. <laughs> Pussy's nice and tight, and she got a big old booty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Vaporsmiths, <laughs> they're a good lay. Try them out if you want. But, uh, or you could just uh, send your money to us and quit smoke, quit vaping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, still, I still much prefer uh, the vapor to the smoke. Um, I've got some cardamizers left. I'll probably finish those out. And I might buy some more Vapor Smiths. I might try another company. I don't know. I did buy some cigars in Hawaii, so I've got some cigars to help supplement, um, you know, additional means of nicotine. The thing. Why don't you try another company, and then if you really like them, we can contact them and see if they want to advertise. Yeah, we might do that. Um, I mean, the, the thing about the vaping 
that really sells me, and and this is probably different for your household since you know your wife isn't um, a non-smoker, so you can smoke in your house in your office. But um, I can't really smoke tobacco products in my household, and so. You know, maybe if I was in a cooler climate, I might be more prone to go sit on the balcony with my laptop and do work outside while I'm smoking a, a cigar or some pipe tobacco. But since I live in Texas, I much prefer to be in the closet with the air conditioning on uh, vaping. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Israel says they're probably going to go to war with Iran before the presidential elections in the United States. That's weird. A weird statement. Yeah, and I feel like this is more of a shot fired in the, um, I guess, public relations war than anything else. I feel like Israel in the past has always been kind of trying to push the envelope and trying to make statements similar to this um, to test the waters of how uh, the public responds to it and how the American delegation and the American government responds to it. So I feel like they're, they're saying stuff like this to see what we say, to sort of test us and maybe get either a tacit green light or, you know, a hell yeah, go ahead and do it kind of kind of statement from politicians. I don't know. I'm sure they have plans in place, but then again, I'm sure they have plans in place to attack a number of countries in a number of different scenarios. Well, I've heard it said that if you join the United States military at this point, you're basically joining the Israeli army. <laughs> at this point? I mean, it seems like it's been that, like that for decades now. Yeah, maybe it's been that way for decades now, and now it's expanded. You're going to uh, be part of the drone World War Three. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing about it is I don't think Israel can really do it without the Americans' help. Um, I mean, the Is Israelis do have, you know, quite a force. but A really badass force with some really badass weapons, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, they don't have the naval power, I think, or the air power, or the ground power to really do it logistically. I don't think they could stretch, uh, you know, the proper supply channels across Iraq and Syria. Uh, they don't have inns like the Americans do. You know, they don't have places, you know, the old Soviet republics like Kyrgyzstan and uh, all those different things that border, border the northern area of Iran and Afghanistan. Um, that would help them out necessarily. Well, the United States also has, uh, if you've ever seen the map of Iran with the dots of the U.S. military bases around yes. it, it's like it's surrounded. And that's what I mean. The Americans already have an infrastructure set up to where, you know, it really wouldn't be hard at all for the Americans to do it logistically, at least for the initial attack. Um you know, who knows what happens after that? You know, it, it's it's a common saying that the battle plan falls apart after the first shot is fired. So who knows what could happen? But I feel like the American infrastructure has a lot better chance of pursuing a campaign like that than the Israelis. Which do. is really weird because uh, Netanyahu is saying that this will be a 30 day war. And I'm like, <laughs> how can you know that? That reminds me of like the conversation I had with Hubert Selby where I told him I was in the process of finishing a 520 page book for my publishing company. And he's like, if you're not finished, how do you know how many pages it's going to be? Yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah. my editor told me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, it's like, I don't write books like that. You know, again, again, that leads me to, to just reiterate that this is probably more of a PR thing than, than anything else. Um, I mean, first of all, if, if it's an actual battle kind of thing, who's, who says that? Who's, who lets the enemy know when we will be attacking you? That that's, that's a ridiculous yeah, on its see, face. If it's not convenient, we can start on Wednesday instead of yes. Tuesday. <laughs> What's good for you? <laughs> What's good for you? Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's not uh, something based in reality. The other thing is, um, I mean, that's, that's a state strategy for getting the people on board. You remember before the Iraq War that we said things like that all the time, that we would be greeted as liberators and it would only cost a few billion dollars and all the costs would be offset by the oil revenues and royalties we might get for that kind of a thing. And they said that, that it would, the invasion of Iraq would only take like, you know, 120 days or something yeah yeah we're still there uh, man we're still there <laughs> exactly this is actually the longest war in u.s history uh which one the the quote-unquote war on terror or are you talking about a specific campaign in in iraq or afghanistan the whole we're in the middle east right now starting with iraq and afghanistan yeah yeah i don't know what's the name for that war <laughs> well it it really depends on how you measure it because, you know, I measure the Iraq War going back to the Gulf War of, of 1991 because even after the Gulf War, we had a no-fly zone in Iraq. Uh, we bombed them regularly, uh, more so when Bill Clinton was in office. So don't – you Democrats out there, don't, don't go thinking that Bill Clinton was some kind of peacemonger because he wasn't. 
peacemonger. Well, I actually take it back to uh, Abraham had two sons. But, <laughs> but that wasn't an American intervention. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I kind of I, I guess I'll believe it when I see it at this point. I mean, I feel like every every season or every fall season, somebody says, oh, well, you know, the October surprise is going to be an Israeli attack on on Iran or Seymour Hirsch back in, I think, 2005 or 2006 was dead set. He found documents and talked to officials and he thought it was going to happen within a few months. Um so I, I feel like this kind of talk about, hey, Iran, you're next and it's going to happen soon. Um, you know, that's just PR babble. I think it's just waiting to see which presidential candidate will be more of a warmonger for Israel. Yeah, that might be it, too. They might be testing the waters to see what the Romney, how the Romney campaign responds, how the Obama campaign responds, um, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, speaking of Romney and Obama... Um, I'm not sure if it was a Newsweek or a Time cover, but I was at the grocery store the other day and I saw a cover on either Newsweek or Time, and it was like, um, you know, a boxing fight night card. You know, it had like Barack Obama yeah. and, and Mitt yeah. Romney, and like, you know, go toe to toe on the issues. And I'm like, toe to toe, they aren't fighting about these kinds <laughs> of things. What, what? I almost wanted to pick it up and like read it and see what they pulled out of the bottom of the barrel for these kind of differences. Because for for a much more astute view on that, you can read you know a uh, hundred ways Mitt Romney and Barack Obama are exactly the same, or watch the YouTube videos about it. And you know, I think that this election more than any, the candidates are closer than they've ever been. Yeah, even to the point of like the flagship legislation of the incumbent was written by the guy he's running against who's saying <laughs> Obama, you know, yeah. Romney's like Obamacare is horrible, you know, but he wrote it basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly like that Futurama skit where in the future, it's like a clone of the yeah. guy who's running yeah. for president is, is running against him. Yeah. I say your Medica plan doesn't go too far enough <laughs> kind of thing. Speaking of Obamacare, um, that Marine who got hauled away, Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I still don't have any follow up on that. There's supposed to be something Monday, but uh, if anyone's got any information, send it to me. Don't post it on my my wall. Just send or it or send me. it to Talkback. Nima's Nima's here. Yeah, now. Nima's done yeah. with vacation, so send it to Talkback so either one of us can respond. Yeah, but um, I was thinking about like things I've seen commonly in my life that are more severe than that, and like yesterday, I got an ad. An ad that they like Facebook had approved over on the right side of Facebook that said Obamacare passed. We're going to have a revolution. <laughs> Click here, <laughs> and I clicked on it. And it was some like boring neocon organization that's you know speaking figuratively, but it's like yes. that's about the same level of severity as what got this guy hauled away. Yes. We're going to have a revolution of voting and doing the same yeah. thing we've been doing yeah. for centuries <laughs> yeah some revolution yeah yeah remind me of um i was getting into a facebook semi argument not necessarily an argument but sometimes you know somebody will post something and then you'll get the requisite status to come on and say it was a picture of democracy or something and how it was mob rule and somebody chimed in and goes america is actually a republic that stands for freedom and so i, I had to sort of take them down a notch um and somebody else was jumped in on, on on the side of you know duh it's not like that um, and he said something to the effect of well we should vote all of the bums out including the president and have and vote for a no president and a no congress people thing <laughs> but I was like wouldn't it be simpler to just not vote <laughs> how about we we take the idea of voting just off the table just let, let's all realize that it's BS well my understanding of what's meant when people say America's a republic not a democracy is that you have representatives. Is that what it means? Who do the voting for you? Yeah, supposedly that would be the, the political science uh, distinction between a democracy or a de direct democracy where everybody votes on everything in sort of a referendum form and uh, a republic, which people could also nitpick even more and say, hey, America's a constitutional republic. So the way it works is we have a constitution that prescribes the boundaries of the government and then we elect representatives who vote on various issues. Um, a... The Constitution has not 
uh, you know, prescribed any boundaries that the government has has not crossed. So that fails. Um, B, the concept of of electing a delegate to represent you. Um, I mean, how silly is that? Especially in this age where we're all connected 24-7 regardless of, of geography. I, I feel like the idea of a representative may have worked when you had, you know, four to 7,000 people in your town and you had to send somebody to go say hey, how the town feels, you know, to some central location. Maybe you might have an argument there from a logistic standpoint, but I don't think that holds water anymore at all. Yeah, and when people say, proudly say, we're a constitutional republic with democracy, I'm like, so is India, and they still have a literal caste system that's involved with the government, you know? <laughs> they have people who are untouchable. You think they can vote? The Soviet Union was a, was a representative democracy too. Uh, you had local Soviets, and you had you know a, a representative from that that would go to whatever uh, the Duma or something like that. Uh, they basically had a system where people were represented by by a representative, and they helped to make decisions. So just because you have something like that doesn't mean you have freedom. Um, and so some people would say, oh well, what about the Constitution that that narrowly prescribes where the government can act? I would say read it newspaper <laughs> the constitution hasn't prescribed any boundaries at all what do you mean by reading newspaper i mean you go through a newspaper and there's stories uh, uh, okay, about every okay. different thing in your life that the government is regulating and if if the government isn't regulating then the the angle of the news story will be and there's no laws that regulate this <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. yeah yeah and, th and then they'll have uh, interviews with somebody who's in an organization some lobbying group trying to pass legislation <laughs> so there will be a law yay yeah yeah so yeah wake up people wake up people i'm mad as hell and i'm not gonna take it anymore <laughs> oh wait that could get me drone now i won't say that <laughs> yeah yeah screw the drones screw the drones Speaking of, of of that and wake up people, um, you and, and Ben Stone always like to say, you know, things or something to the effect of things are probably going to get worse before they get better. Um, and I think there's more evidence of that. We've talked before about the Department of Homeland Security getting millions of rounds of hollow point ammo. Um, there's this guy, a retired major general, uh, Jerry Curry, who recently had an opinion piece in the Daily Caller. Um, where he talks about both the DHS getting 750 million rounds of hollow point in addition to the 400 something million they got a few months ago. They've got more now as of March. And, um, but it's not just Department of Homeland Security. They're distributing this to other agencies like the Social Security Administration. <laughs> so they can shoot the old people, they shoot the rioting old people when they cut off Social Security. And get this the National Oceanic and Atmospheric <laughs> Administration, which is basically the Weather Service. So yeah. the people who predict what the weather will be and the climate patterns are going to get 46,000 rounds of hollow point ammo. If anyone says that global warming is a farce, they can shoot them. <laughs> yeah, and to me, it just sort of cemented Michael's idea that, you know, eventually every bureaucrat will have a gap. Well, you know, I'm looking at this K2 Radio uh, Super 8 hotel standoff hostage situation thing. It's been updated, but there's no new news. But I'm looking at the pictures, and the people that are, like, coming in, that they're goons. At first, I thought they were, like, uh, National Guard, but it doesn't say that. Those are police. So, you know, it's our police with a bear cat, uh... <laughs> you know, I, I was talking to some bureaucrat here, or actually a guy that works for the city, and I was like, you know, talking about the bear cat situation in Keene, New Hampshire, and he's like, oh, they've had one of those here for like eight years. Yeah, they love their, t <laughs> those guys love their toys in this town, and he was like friends with the chief of police. He's like, yeah, man, they love their toys. Oh, they do, they do, yeah. Have you seen the bear cat? You seen the, the vehicles they have here? Not Casper's bear cat, but I've seen the bear cat in, in Washington. Yeah, and I've seen pictures. So I, so maybe uh, Casper. Then if they've had their bear cat for eight years, I bet they're trying to get a new one now. Since the yeah. Department of Homeland Security is handing those things out like candy to every jurisdiction, regardless of population size, it seems. This guy, th this thing, standoff will probably end. You know, the guy's probably in there with his crack whore trying to bust a nut, and he's got speed weenie and can't get it up. And he's like, "Come on, man, <laughs> just give me five more minutes. Five more minutes, I'll come out on my own." <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. Um, the, the other point I wanted to make about, uh, you know, 
these agencies getting all this hollow point ammo is some some of the agencies have said well these are mostly for training and proficiency um but a commentator on the daily caller site pretty much debunk that although i guess it's common sense who uses hollow point defense ammo for training people that don't have to pay for it yeah that's another good point so it's either it's either they're lying about if they're training or proficiency or they're wasting your money by using super expensive ammo to punch holes through paper instead of just full metal jacket value packs from winchester although you know really if if i had unlimited money of mine i would i would uh train with what i'm going to carry i mean you really should you know the the thing you do when you're being economical is you shoot ballpoint to practice. You know, shoot 500 rounds a month of it, and then shoot like 50 rounds a month of the hollow point you're going to carry. But they don't have to pay for it, so yeah. they just. But the the thing, you know, a lot of people were making a, like non gun people were making a big deal of the fact that it's hollow point. And I'm like, that's what you carry. The thing I was making a big point of, other than the fact that they're arming all these agencies that you wouldn't think it'd be armed is the fact that a lot of it was 357 sig which is a very expensive caliber it's more expensive by two or three times than uh 40 and it's basically 40 you know it's uh it's it's basically a, a neck down 357 uh magnum that can work in a semi-auto now what i would like there is one semi-auto gun that reliably fires 357 uh magnum which is uh it's one of those desert eagle i think they're israeli and they're really expensive but okay i thought i thought when i was shopping for guns i thought a three i thought i saw a 357 caliber in the the sp by um springfield or not the xp the XD. yeah there's a glock i think that carries it i'm not sure but i know that it used to be the agency that carried it was the air marshals because 357 sig with frangible bullets is ballistically the best thing to fire on an airplane if you have to fire ah, on an airplane because okay. it will stop someone and if you miss them it will not go through the wall of the plane. Oh good. Good. But hmm. I don't know why I don't know I don't know why there's Okay, let's go up the tree here. I don't know why they're using 357 SIG. I don't know why they're using uh uh, hollow point bullets to practice. I don't know why they're buying so much of it. I don't know why they're buying it for these agencies uh and why is there a government? <laughs> nice tree i like your tree <laughs> excellent speaking of trees uh we had to go in and put plug a hole in your fence today we discovered that rat retro share by default shares your entire hard drive with any of your friends fortunately Ooh. i was your only friend at yeah. this point i'm your <laughs> only friend but you know if you'd gone on there and added a bunch of people, they could have just looked at and downloaded anything on your hard drive. Yeah, yeah, that, that would have been horrible. And it actually may, with the default, it goes to your whole network, which is one or two levels of people above you. And fortunately, uh, nobody hacked us, I think, because it's uh, trustable people one level above us. Right, right. It's trustable hackers, man. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, so... If you start RetroShare, make sure you go ahead and change that. Just go to um, – where do we go? We went to File, and we just changed the folder that was available. Yeah, you go to Files, and then in the bottom part of it, it says My Directories, My Files, right. and it shows your whole hard drive. What you have – what we had to do – you couldn't just click on it and turn it off. What you have to do is make a shareable document uh, folder on your desktop, like just call it you know Stuff or something, and then go to the little – add share the folder with the plus on it on the left um add it and then choose browsable not network wide yep and then hit okay and then hit close and then that'll show up and then you had to remove the other ones with the same method right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep actually i think to remove it you just right clicked on it and there is a remove option yeah, but but play with it. So if you do retro share, uh, we are advising um, before you add anybody. Yes, remove sharing for the whole network of all your folders. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> which is a really weird default. I kind of feel like since this is made for hackers, they set it up that way for hacking noobs or something. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, they want to pawn you. Is it pawn or pwn? I was actually alerted to it by a hacker who's in our network. He was like, hey, I can see your, you know. <laughs> your hard drive is showing. <laughs> your naked ass hard drive hanging out. So uh, here's what you do. Okay. Yep. Okay. Excellent. News you can use. Um... Post recording edition here. Neem and I are no longer recommending RetroShare. We both had horrible 
problems with our computers, which may or may not have been caused by it, but uh, they started when we added it and went away when we uninstalled it. And uh, that was the reason that there was a broken episode of this that went up today before we fixed this. So that's a collector's item for the 65 of you who downloaded that before we decided to fix it and got our computers fixed and decided to redo this. All right. I think we should take a little break here and save the file, Michael. But people, before we go to uh, sell some things... Stay away from CY and Wyoming Avenue today. It's been blocked off. It's congested. There's a police action. You don't want to go there, people. No, sir. You can subscribe to Freedom Fiends via the RSS link on the top right of any page. It's orange. Or you can subscribe via email at the subscribe by email link at the top of the right sidebar on any page. It's a little bit below the search field. You'll need to respond to a one-time confirmation email, but after that, you will only receive an email each time a new episode posts. The Freedom Fiends respect your privacy. We will not spam you and will not sell, rent, or share your email address. And you are free to unsubscribe at any time. Tired of the false economy? Want to carry real money in a form that people will dig getting? Don't Tread on Meme now has Freedom Fiends and Guns and Weed Silver Dime Cards. Collect all four. Trade them with your friends. Freedom Fiends Silver Dime Cards are also great for starting conversations with statists about liberty. Go to FreedomFiends.com today and click the link at the top that says Silver Dime Cards. That's FreedomFiends.com. Yo, boy. What it do? Speaking of boy, uh, I saw New Jack City the other day on TV. Oh, yeah? What'd There's, you think? Oh, it's a silly little popcorn movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's what got Ice-T uh, cast as a cop in Law & Order, I'm sure. Ah, uh, did he, he play a cop in that? Yeah. It's also got Chris Rock as a crackhead, which he later parodies in CB4 when he does his crackhead moment. <laughs> it's like the same kind of room, the same look on his face. Nice, nice. Did um did Ice T have a court order to play a cop on TV to make up for his song Cop Killer? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh probably a court order from his publicist. Um ah, yeah. or an order yeah, from his publicist. Too. But uh yeah, when I said boy, it's got um a young Flava Flav in it performing in a club with uh what was his group? Uh Public Enemy. No, was it? Yeah. Flava Flav, yeah. Public Enemy, Chuck D, Flavor Flav, yeah. Terminator X. Yeah. Yeah, they go into a club, and he's up there ringing in the new year, not looking as ridiculous as he does now. <laughs> I'm looking at Wikipedia now. Flavor Flav performing in 2009, wearing the customary large clock. Yes, that's gotta have a large clock. Because you got to know what time it is. <laughs> it's Public Enemy time? No, now it's just Flavor Flav. Well, that's what it was. I think it's it was v- a- VH1 reality show oh, no. time. It was a takeoff on, uh, you know... You got you know know what time it is like know what's going on yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah um speak, speaking of old school hip hop uh, our our last cast name was a reference to old school hip hop oh yeah ladies love the cool freedom fiends is a reference to LL Cool J stands for ladies love cool James <laughs> which I actually didn't know um maybe that, that that's a little too old school for me i remember ll cool j but it was like on a comeback album um don't call it a comeback was that him <laughs> no it was after that it was um mama said knock it was, you it was, out it was that album with uh with loungin which was a know. good song but the loungin loungin remix was a lot better yeah yeah Oh, line! Mama said, "Knock you out." Is the line is "Don't call it a comeback," isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. LL Cool J is all right. It's just uh, maybe, maybe his early stuff was a little bit more hardcore, but um, I don't know. I guess I get sick of hearing a rapper rap about how lucky he is <laughs> in his love life. It's like good for you, ladies. Love <laughs> Cool James. <laughs> yeah. Um, Speaking of, of rap that's of substance and rap that's not of substance, uh, when I was on vacation in Lake Powell, um, remember that rapper Loki? We, we posted yeah. a video of him, um, and it had a loopy fiasco sample um, about Obama being a racist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, Loki's album, oh, God, what's – Soundtrack to the Struggle or, or Struggle Soundtrack or something to that effect. Uh, there's some really, really good tracks on that uh, with actual, like – detailed research um so if you're in for if, if you're down for a more enlightened Edu- but, but, edutainment right right but but not conscious stuff like be positive don't do drugs stay well, that was kind of public enemies thing i mean they 
they kind of presented themselves as the news. Like in their videos, they would be like, mm-hmm. you know, and now Public Enemy News, and they'd be like, you know, wear, one of them be wearing a suit, giving the newscast. They were the first to do that. Right, right. But I, I much prefer something that like takes down the state rather than something like uh, stay in school or don't do. I, <laughs> well, I don't want it to be a dare enemy, lesson. Public Enemy you know? wasn't stay in school. No, they, they don't, weren't. But, but they were. But Nas has done songs like that. I think um, they were more like uh, you know Spike Lee for president, and he'll fix everything. <laughs> right, right, right. Although there were a couple Farrakhaniites in that group that liked Public Enemy. No, there were a couple people in Public Enemy who were Farrakhan followers. Wasn't Professor Griff a uh, Farrakhan a yite? I don't know. When I think of Public Enemy, I just think of Chuck D, Flava Flav, and Terminator X. I didn't yeah, know but remember they all people. they all wore like military kind of stuff. Like you know, they looked like a militia or something. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'll have to do a little more hip hop hmm. history Professor, research. Professor Griff is a member of the Nation of Islam and the Nation of God and Earths. I don't know what that is. Which his lyrics and record titles often reference. Another general theme in his lyrics is the New World Order conspiracy. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, that was that was a. We talked a while back about rappers that rapped about that, and we didn't bring him up. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a theme before Alex Jones. I mean... Uh, the, new, the New World Order has been a theme since... Uh, the first people I heard of talking about it was in the 50s, and it was the John Birch Society. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, huh. Uh, the first time I can remember thinking about it or learning about it was uh, the Goody Mob in their song, Who's That Peeking in My Window? Pow! Nobody now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's actually CeeLo who has the best verse in that, talking about the New World Order. <laughs> wow. The John Birch Society, one of the founders was Fred Koch, uh, the Koch of the Koch brothers. I didn't know that. He, call, he called him Koch. <laughs> yeah, Koch. Koch. The Koch, Koch brothers. The Crotch brothers. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've heard yeah. what their uh, mouthpieces have to say about us in that Guns, Drugs, and the Ron Paul Revolution article on accuracy in media. Accuracy in media, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was uh, on, on my last... Uh, trip. Um, there was a guy there, and I was sort of talking about what I do, and he was like, "Oh, well, maybe you should just get the the Koch brothers to fund you and put you on NPR." And I was thinking, "Hmm, I don't you think d- the Koch brothers or NPR would want to hear anything from us or support us in well, any way." I kind of thought we were going to blow up, and that's after that article. And I'm not saying we're going to blow things up. I'm saying uh, just to be <laughs> sure. Uh, I thought we were going to become stars overnight because of that article. I really thought we were going to be like, you know, like Bill O'Reilly would be arguing with us on his show yeah. the next People week. People would be like, guns, weed, what is? Yeah. <laughs> what is? What's that from? <laughs> Zoidberg and Futurama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, there were that did get reblogged on a lot of like patriot right wingy blogs, and I was kind of really dismayed because some of the people agreeing with it and dissing us and all of our friends seemed like people that I used to think would be of our ilk, you know, like mm-hmm. patriot constitutionalist, uh, you know, like like we'd agree with a lot of things with those people, a lot of things we'd agree with a lot of what's wrong. And and those are people who would like not back Romney, and they'd probably back Ron Paul if they were going to back anybody. But you know, a lot of them were like, "This has gone too far." I don't know if they were Ron Paul. I don't know what their politics were, but there were a lot of people who who were like not conventional patriots, but like what the SPLC calls patriots, who were dissing us in the comments on that. Yeah. Well, see, the thing I think about where those kind of people. Where their intellectual thoughts come from, uh, maybe there's a better way of wording that, but I think a lot of it is from fear. You know, those are generally the people that are anti-immigration, um, and I think this is the flaw in their logic. They, they they dislike or are scared of things that are unknown to them, and they think the gov- the U.S. government is moving more towards a direction like that, where there's going to be amnesty and uh, you know lots of illegal immigrants in a Muslim brotherhood taking over. You know, with the new caliphate is going to take everything over. And there's going to be Sharia law. So I think if if you're looking at it from that kind of an angle. The flaw in their thinking is that at some point in history, America was free, and we got to get back to what we know because we know America was free 30, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, and if you but think that, Ameri- that's, you know, that's it, a flawed premise because America <laughs> wasn't free back then. Any patriot who thinks America was free 100 years ago should study the volunteer, uh, what was it called? The, the, the bonus army. The bonus army. Yeah, man. That was where. Have we talked about that much on here? No. You mentioned it a little bit, but you didn't explain what okay, it was. Okay. Bonus Army was, uh, after World War One, 43,000 U.S. vets 
from all branches of service from World War One, um, were asking the government to give them their bonus that they were promised early. It wasn't due for a few more years. But it was 1932. It was the depression. People were starving and losing their house, their farms and things. Um, which, you know, why wasn't there a free market solution? Why couldn't you take your bonus certificate and sell it at half price to someone else who could yeah, sit on yeah. it for a couple of years? But that wasn't offered. Kind of like those late night sense. TV commercials um, that offers to pay you money for your, your cash settlement. So it's a lump sum instead of, you know, paid out over so many years. Yeah. So they went to Washington, D.C. and camped out and protested. In 1932, and Herbert Hoover ordered the military to go in and quell them, and they were beaten and killed and burned and choked and destroyed. I mean, you know, way beyond like what people often see it stuff now. Like now, you know, they'll club a couple people's right. heads and they, they were much more than pepper them, sprayed then, while they were sitting down. Yeah, yeah, uh, and the leaders of this. Milit uh, of the the not of the government who were beating up the protesters were Douglas MacArthur, Dwight D. Eisenhower, mm. and General George S. Patton, who were considered three of the greatest military heroes. You know, after the American Revolution, those guys were were killing American vets. So if you are a patriot and think we got to get back to way the way America was a hundred yeah. years ago. Yeah. That's how America was, you know, not even a yep, hundred yep. years ago. Patton, Seven, MacArthur, and Eisenhower, they were, they were rewarded for their loyalty to the state, not the people. They were rewarded for their loyalty to the state by getting the, the you know, appointments and promotions that allowed them to be the leaders of World War II. Uh, and not only that, but... Yeah, and, and become, one became president. Right, right. And so, so if you think about, you know, those statements like, uh, they're fighting for our freedoms. Well, that was their reward. Those are, the, <laughs> those are what they were fighting for. They weren't fighting for our freedoms. They were fighting for a state that, in for the favor, killed them. Yeah. Dead. Bastards. So, so those patriots, I, I would say, you're operating on a false premise. You know, uh, conservatives especially, that word, conserve, like we yeah. should get back to, to some mythical state of the American state that was free and peaceful. Uh, there was not one, so that's a false premise. And if anybody says, well, yeah, that's, you know, that was after the Federal Reserve started, which is true. Uh, we're coming up on 100 years of that. So, uh, you know, if you want to say, well, we need to go back to how it was right after the revolution. Okay. Um, right after the revolution, George Washington, the founding father that a lot of patriots venerate, uh, went in and killed a bunch of Americans for not paying taxes that were bigger than the taxes they'd fought against. Those same people as soldiers had fought against in the Revolutionary War. So, <laughs> no matter how far back you go, I would I would have made a stop there in the midpoint with the Northern War of Aggression. Abraham Lincoln is responsible for killing more Americans than anybody else in the history of the world, um, and the South did not want to take over the North. They they weren't fighting a war of aggression. They were fighting a war of independence. Um, you know, in a covenant where the states. You know, were expected to be able to leave the Union if they disagreed with the Union. That was sort of a, a unspoken thing when all the states ratified the Constitution. So and, you know, if you wanted to talk about, like, state solutions that would have been better than killing all those Americans, Lincoln could have taken tax money and bought all the slaves up from the South <laughs> and ended slavery and freed them, and it would have been economically a lot cheaper and nobody would have died. Uh, he could have also gotten rid of uh, fugitive slave laws, right? Um, when Tom Woods talks about nullification, one of his biggest examples is there were northern states that uh, did not follow the federal law about runaway slaves. They, they decided, hey, we're not participating in this. We don't believe in slavery. So if we find a runaway slave, we're not going to shackle him and send him back to his owner. That's just not something we're going to do. Um, so but that was a federal law that basically said, you know, if a runaway slave runs away, you know, he should be returned to his owner. So if Abraham Lincoln really wanted a solution, if his goal was really to end slavery or stop this, he could have stopped that law to stop the the government law that basically forced people to return runaway slaves slavery was on its way out too because of mechanization and an interesting thing to point out is uh and i don't know what you want to take away from this but it wasn't just about slavery it was about the ability to rule yourself you know i hate slavery i hate that there was that aspect of it but most of the people that fought for the south in the Civil War didn't own slaves. 
<laughs> they didn't have the money to own slaves. I mean, you couldn't own slaves unless you had, you could pay an overseer, you know, like a guy couldn't just, own, a couple couldn't just own a slave because the slave would kill them in their sleep and run away. <laughs> to own slaves, you had to have, you know, say if you had 20 or 30 slaves, you had to have two or three or five guys who would work in shifts 24-7 to keep them from running away. Right, right. You know? Well, I... Somebody emailed Talkback, I think, or, or some, some of one of our media things, and was asking, well, how would slavery have been abolished without ah, the state? All right. Uh, uh, you go, Nima. You tell. I'll be right back. Well, well, that's the first thing, is that, A, the state perpetuated slavery through fugitive slave laws. Um, but, B, I sort of it, it depends on how we define the state. I would consider slavery a function of the state. It is, in essence, uh, a state action, because, to me, the state is – the thought in people's mind, the myth in people's mind that uh, a small group of people can have control or ownership because basically they're the same thing, control and ownership. Uh, control is a form of ownership. You can only control things that you own or have some right to, some type of ownership in some way. So the state, the idea that that you, a few people can control uh, the many, that that is in essence slavery. So if you are a slave owner, you're, you're buying into this myth that I am this one person and I can have ownership over these people. So to me, slavery is in a essence statism or a form of statism. It might be a difference in degree, uh, but I believe it is the same kind. It also, you know, poor treatment of black people after emancipation was propagated by the state. You know, when Jim Crow laws were laws. Yeah. So people say yeah. without the government we would still have jim crow laws. and even well, a lot of the extra and look extra that. legal stuff like you know a lot of the heads of the kkk were the local sheriff and when when someone got lynched uh you know a lot of times the sheriff would look the other way yeah and there were and there were there was actually this is kind of evil there was jury nullification from white people who killed black people yeah yeah the jury the jury wouldn't wouldn't convict the white person for killing the black person right which is kind isn't that kind of what to kill a mockingbird was about yeah which somebody could say is uh is is well it's also kind of what um Grisham's first novel was about what was Time it to Kill Yeah uh which which was a movie with Samuel L yeah, Jackson Great movie great movie So yeah f for those of you who think that <laughs> that we need to get to some past form of the state or the American government um think again guys we need to move forward into a, a society without a state Now that that's how you achieve freedom Let's talk about jury nullification for a few minutes, which we think is great, and it's great that it's legal now in New Hampshire. Um, you know, I would never practice it in a state where it's not legal. If I'm on a jury, I'm going to convict if the person is uh, guilty. That's my... I Absolutely. I'm not kidding. I am. Let's put it on the record. So, um, go on. What would stop a jury, you know, in this day and age, what would happen if a jury nullified in a real capital crime like if there was a murder and uh the seated jury was just like we find that the law is wrong in this case i think they would just seat another jury wouldn't they <sighs> i guess think? it depends on the case and a number of different factors like um how the media is playing it and, and things like that where it's at uh, who ki who killed who well, i, I mean if it was like a citizen killing a cop and the jury nullified I also, yeah, I mean, like, well, I think it would depend, too, on, like, what the judge's right is yeah. in that situation. And, you know, if if they have that right for a murder case, would they have that right for a pot case? I don't know. I'm not an attorney. Uh, maybe we could ask somebody uh, else on LRN who might have the... Uh, well, never mind. Put those worms back in that can, Michael. I feel like the other thing with nullification and stuff like that is if a prosecutor has it out for you, he's going to try to get you on something else. So if it's a pot thing and, and the jury nullifies you, uh, you know, the cops are just going to harass you all the time. You slip up again, you, you, you're growing pot, whatever. Th well, they can bust you again. The prosecutor can bust you again. Uh, there's you know that book, guy, Three Felonies you know a Day, to where you know about, if, you know about the guy in Vermont that recently drove a tractor over like six police cars, right? Ooh. No, no. You don't? I do. Dude, don't. you take too many friggin' vacations. I'm um, done with them. Quit yelling at me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was absent. I'm sorry. Until, until Christmas. <laughs> yes, you need yes. to catch up on your notes. Um, there was a guy in Vermont about a month ago who, and he's being, there's actually a web, uh, a Facebook page praising him as a hero. He did kind of a killdozer thing, but he didn't even build a killdozer. He just took... A tractor. I don't know if it was his or somebody else's, but he drove a tractor over like six parked cop cars and ruined them and flattened them. <laughs> and uh, he said he did it 
because the cops had been hassling him for like 20 years in that town over pot stuff and over wow. you know like they just had had a systematic persecution of him going on wow, wow. he's in jail but he's in jail and people are people are sending him donations from all over the world yeah yeah you know i guess what i have to say about that is resist the temptation I mean, we know the state is violent. They're they're in the wrong, you know, most of the time. Well, I, I guess they're in the wrong all the time because they're based on wrongness. Or um, move, <laughs> but, but yeah, move. Don't don't throw a rock in the giant's eye because he's going to come after you hard. You know, and there's no way you yeah. can defeat the state uh, as one person. Yeah, um, we we all need the state to dissolve, but you, you can't get it to zo- dissolve by throwing rocks at it. We're just going to wish it to dissolve. We're going to think happy thoughts. And that's the whole thing. I mean, how do you feel about that? I kind of feel like sometimes um, that we're using magical thinking of thinking we can educate enough people. But I also kind of feel like whether that's true or not, I can't not do it. You know, it's my purpose in life to get up in the morning and do this. You know, I just go back to when you interviewed Stefan Molyneux and he said, you know, we don't need to worry about that. Don't don't who gives a, a fuck who listens uh, what they take from it. You just got to go hard in the paint, basically do your own thing, because that's all you can do is attack it with as much passion and reason as you have at your disposal um, and just attack it in that way until it goes away. Or if it doesn't, at least you fought the valiant fight. You you died standing on your feet. You know, you have to play the game and we're talking about a figurative fight not a literal fight and a uh, a figurative fight but uh, in the end i mean it's obvious you can't defeat the state through violent means so that that path is just ruled out i think i guess i kind of look at making media like throwing a message in a bottle you know you never know if anyone's gonna read it or not which you know i mean we get a lot of emails but like one percent of the people that download us write to us or contact us so there's a lot of message in a bottle kind of stuff happening out there you know i was i told you like i had a near spiritual revelation the night that i realized someone at church farm school where i got kicked out of and really didn't like being and was kind of pushed around by the the school and the kids and you know put in the hospital by the kids it was like that that was not a good place to be and the the fact that someone from church farm school was listening to our podcast and and he never contacted me but i saw it as a search term and someone from that town and it's got to be it's a tiny town it's all that's there is that school you know some boy from that school was listening to us because he'd searched his school he'd searched church farm school sucks and ended up on our podcast and i was like that was a message in a bottle moment for me yeah yeah i mean i guess the thing is the state will end when it's time for the state to end and I, I think it will end I think it is a foregone conclusion because it is on its face ridiculous um, it is when we made this analogy before but it, it is the thought that the earth uh, is the center of the universe which is scientifically <laughs> disprovable once something is so disprovable as being a workable system uh, eventually it will be taken over by a more workable system. I, I think I, I <laughs> firmly the, believe that 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 will happen. I don't and know then, when. And then the government will ship the libertarians off to a move a moon in another galaxy, like <laughs> sort of like a, like the penal colony of uh, Australia. Well, that's a good, another good point. A lot of people make the argument that um, the places where there is true freedom tends to be frontiers. You know, places where since the state is always sort of behind and slow. That's why Wyoming is still kind of free i mean it's not free but it's like there's less people here and less cops per people here and the politicians are a little more quaint and silly and uh and yeah and you can carry guns yep the the state has less of a foothold um you know i think there are frontiers i i think we need to be a little bit more imaginative um, but I think they're all frontiers. You know, I was snorkeling in Hawaii, and you realize uh, <laughs> this is not your domain at all, right? It covers two-thirds of the world. Um, that's not humanity's domain at all. That That's a frontier. You don't have to leave the planet to find a frontier. Um, I was fond of saying Antarctica is a frontier, which I guess it still is, but there's been a, a photo circling around libertarian circles of uh, the U.S. Air Force landing scientists onto Antarctica using their Air Force plane. <laughs> oh, they've been doing that for 50 years. Yeah, they have, but um, there are still frontiers, and there's still technological advancements to help humanity, you know, on the way to help humanity sort of move into those frontiers. Um Maybe that is one of the the multi pronged approach for liberty in not necessarily our lifetimes, but li- liberty in in the human race's lifetime. I have a peanut. 
good for you. Peanut. I thought you're not supposed to eat those anymore since no. you're going primal. Oh, no, you can eat those. No, <laughs> Peanut, the cat, is sitting on my lap. Cat. And let's go sell some stuff. All right. Worms. You're listening to the Freedom Fiends podcast. Freedom Fiends is now available for 24-7 streaming to your iPhone, Android phone, or other chromed robot turd. Click on the streaming audio link on freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. This year, you can experience a taste of Libertopia. Libertopia is a voluntary community based on freedom and peace. Visit the three-day festival this October 11th to 14th at Humphrey's Half Moon Inn on the San Diego Bay. With speakers, workshops, parties, and wonderful people, Libertopia has it all. Become a member of this peaceful voluntary community now. Visit Libertopia.org. Tickets and hotel rooms are going quickly, so make sure to reserve yours today. Find out more at Libertopia.org. So if people want to get uh, VPNs, it helps uh, with BitTorrenting if you're blocked on your local BitTorrent. Um, helps with BitTorrenting how? You can do it. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Also, you know, I have found that that peer block, like you had mentioned before, also really does help. Yeah. I don't know if it's because I have a new ISP now, but um, when I was in Washington State and not using peer block, whenever I would open uTorrent or download a torrent, uh, just the fact that the program BitTorrent was open uh, would mean that I'm not allowed to access the internet. Like the the internet would basically shut off for me, other than the torrent program. Yeah, well, Bit uh, Peer Block blocks a bunch of IP addresses, like millions of them, from governments, snoopers media companies, and probably your ISP. Like you know, their their search snoop ip yeah yeah their spy bot yeah tries to spy on you yep and um we now offer two wonderful uh we have two sponsors one is bola vpn there's a link on the site the other is metropipe.net slash fiends which i will also link and uh, they're good. We have both of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. Um, and that goes back to our, our newer theme of trying to tell you how to be a free person yourself. I feel like um, as people, we've sort of grown past the look at all these horrible things the government is doing. This, the government and the state are completely evil. Uh, hopefully our listeners get that point by now. If you don't have that as an understanding uh, or basic premise, then please go back and listen to our previous episodes. Uh, you'll get to watch Michael's growth from a minarchist into it. Um, Ew. <laughs> Michael's growth. Michael's growth. Look at it. Look at it. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, now I, I think we should talk more about, and you, you've made this clear, we want to talk more about solutions, you know, uh, what you can do to be free yourself. Um, not just solutions uh, on a whole, but also solutions for the individual. Um, and I guess I guess fantasies as well, because a lot of a lot of these are sort of half baked fantasies I have about how I would like to see things work. For instance, we're talking about you know ways to be free, you know, in your virtual self, your online personal effects and documents. Um, but you know, I, I've I've heard a few rumblings about ways to bypass the TSA when you're flying. You know, local charters, small planes, things like that. I feel like I'd like to see a lot more of that or, or other ideas or ways that entrepreneurs can help people to circumvent the TSA. Rich, pe rich people with private planes don't go through TSA. Right, right. If you have a private plane, luckily it's private. I guess they figure that rich people have too much going for them to want to do anything bad. But, you know, uh, but Bin Laden was a billionaire. Yeah, yeah. Well... You know, I, I feel like there's got to be more creative ways than just private jets and charter planes because those are more expensive. But really, there's a market niche there. I mean, is there anybody in the world that likes being groped by the TSA, that likes going through the scanners? I mean, I know there are people that say something to the effect of, of hey, well, as long as we're protected, it's okay. But they're not like, yay, touch my, touch my junk. Touch it, touch it. <laughs> that might be somebody's kink, but uh, we shouldn't have to pay for it and put up with it. You can just recreate <laughs> it in your house. You can get the yes. the my my first butt. What was that? That toy? My, my first butt swiper. <laughs> that my first. No, my uh, it was a little thing with like little 
doll kind of things. Yeah, of like, yeah. It was, it was, it's a Lego knockoff. Not a knockoff brand because it's actually yeah. pretty expensive. But yeah. um, I forget what it was, but it was like a My First Security playset. Something yeah. to that effect. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was the little conveyor belt and a scanner and a goon with a wand. You know, if you, if you really like that fantasy... Just build it in your home and do it with someone you love consensually. Yes, don't yes. do it, don't make us do it, man. Don't don't force it on people that don't share your kink. Yeah. But I don't know, maybe maybe you could have airports that are offshore in international waters that'll fly <laughs> you around and then you can take a charter boat to the port. Maybe that's their kink is making other people do it. <laughs> ah, kink is statism. If they're bad, if they're bad kinky people. Yeah, yeah. Um, statism is kink. But there are a lot of modern conveniences that are plagued by the state. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we're, we're trying to think of ways to end the state so that we can enjoy conveniences, unencumbers, and, and, and things that the state doesn't have their hands in, or ways to do the all the modern, lovely things that we love to do without having the state involved. I mean, that's what all this internet security stuff is, right? It's a way for us to enjoy the wonders of the internet, but not have nanny bots uh, seeing what we're doing and reporting it back to the NSA. Uh, so there's got to be ways to do that in a, a real-life situation rather than just a virtual world. I haven't come up with some kind of great business plan for this but i don't have to i'm i'm asking people and, and and encouraging people to do it themselves so that we can all take advantage of it yeah and you and you the entrepreneur can make money I mean, that, that's the wonders of the market right yeah we want things and people want to make money off of people who want things so yeah yeah but all i've got so far is build me a suit that's impenetrable by any weapon so i can <laughs> do whatever the hell i want without so you having can have cops your, harass me so you can have your your mobile temporary autonomous zone <laughs> yes exactly yeah i did a great interview with someone about autonomous zones, which is something we talked about a long time ago, but I talked with a guy who's written a book about it. Yeah. Whose name is Smuggler, who's really <laughs> well known in, in the white hat hacker community. I mean, like, I, I told people I interviewed Smuggler, and they're like, whoa, you got an interview with Smuggler? Man, he's the real deal. Um, which is coming out a week from this Saturday on, uh, on the gumbo, so keep an eye out for nice. that at kittyfeet.com. That's kittyfeet.com. <laughs> Kitty feet, yo. That's horrible. No, you do it. You can do it better than me. Kitty feet, yo. I can't do it now. You ruined it. <laughs> well, you know, that's the thing about, like, a lot of funk bands back in the day when they were singing would be like, meow, kind of like that, like kind of nasally. Uh -huh. It actually, you can actually harmonize better. It's a lot easier to harmonize when you're doing the kind of nasally singing. Huh. Why do you think that is? I don't know, but it's a fact. I've tried it and it works. Oh, okay. Okay. Hmm. Um, I think I've only tried to harmonize with myself using autotune. So yeah, you're probably better at knowing how to harmonize. Yeah, than I'm I probably am. better at being able to sing than you. Speaking of which, yes, though, definitely. I love your rapping, and you get a little better at singing too. I really would like to uh, cut this a little short and put one of your song, new songs, at the end of this. Ah, I mean, not we don't okay. have to stop yet, but uh, you know, stop at 15 instead of 20 on this one and put in one of your songs. Would you do that? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose we can tease the audience with a song. Which one? Um, no, no, Crocodile. <laughs> not No Crocodile yeah. or Eat My Nuts or Jack Boots would be the three I'd want to choose from. Okay. I don't want to do the one that's going to get me droned. There's one in there that would get me droned. You know which one it is. I don't want to put I, that one I don't up. think either of them will get you droned. Um, uh, we'll talk later. Okay, we'll talk later. But yes, coming up at the end of this cast, you'll hear either Eat My Nuts, Not No Crocodile, or Jack Boots. Yeah, and you'll be hearing an MP3 made from an MP3, which will encourage you to later buy the music. So <laughs> yes. Nima's not going to send me a wave. I'm going to just use the MP3 I have, but we have to do some talking offline and decide. Um, so also, as far as other great promotional stuff... Uh, the Freedom Fiends, Freedom Fiends Radio, our streaming server, is now on iTunes Radio. So in iTunes, you can click on Radio, and uh, it's in the upper left-hand corner, and then go to the list of, of genres. And if you pick News Talk Radio or Talk Radio News, whatever it is, News Talk Radio, and scroll down the list on Freedom Fiends Radio, click that. It says next to it, Tasing You with Liberty Since 2011. And uh, I got that fixed. And you will be hearing us streaming 24-7 on iTunes. Tell people. Oh, yeah. Spread the word. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Testify. Now, um...
so that that links to our streaming server. Yeah, whereas, you can just go to our website and click on the little link on our server too. But uh, right, right. it would also be useful for like you know iTunes kind of like you know i devices. Like it should work in an iPhone or an iPad if you can't get the link on the site to work. Because it's Apple, okay. it's got to work, man. Someone re- call in and let us know. Here we are live. <laughs> just, just another anarchist road to our anarchist media. Yes, and speaking another, of roads, another pathway. Roads. Fuck if you're the out, roads. It, there's a lot of congestion around CY and Wyoming Boulevard, so stay clear of that if you're out driving around Casper today. <laughs> yes, the the goons have taken it over. Body in a hotel. Yeah. 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 So I I would really be willing to bet that it's a drug warrant. Yeah. I I be, I'd bet dollars to donuts. And the guy just doesn't want to. He doesn't want to turn himself in till he cracks his nut with his crack hoe, and he's up been up all night on stimulants. And you know we all know how from past experience how hard it is to pop a nut when you're on stimulants. Yeah. Yeah. You either can't get it up, or you can can get it up but you can't come. So you know. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, we have been talking about trying to find solutions. <laughs> I want to see. I want to see more businesses with solutions to the cop problem. Um, places where they have secret passageways, <laughs> underground railroads to an autonomous zone. Well, so if the cops come knocking at your hotel yeah. room, you can <laughs> duck down into the tunnel for something and get away. that's not a violent crime. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see technology being used more with that. I mean, there are apps, for instance, that'll tell you where the speed traps are in a major metropolitan mm-hmm. city. Um, but they don't necessarily... Yeah, and the, co- the cops are pissed about that. Yeah, and I'm sure they're trying to outlaw it. But, you know, if it gets outlawed, it could go dark net. Dark net, people. Explore <laughs> the dark net. Well, wait, which is funny because the cops want people to slow down in those areas. If people see the app, they're going to slow down. Yeah. So the cops yeah. get what they want yeah. other than your money, which there goes you to go. show you what they really want. Yeah, and they, and they don't get to get the little adrenaline rush from writing you a ticket and going... <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they don't get their dicks hard. They don't go... <laughs> 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 Their heart, their heart pulses a little harder in there. They're, yeah, they're, yeah. I'm not very poetic today, but you know, if you want to read poetry that's fucking kick ass and dirty, read my first book, Starving in the Company of Beautiful of Beautiful Women. I'll link it on this episode too, and I'll yes, also yes. link our uh, torrent things. So, I have a correction from a previous thing. I was talking about the guy, the guy who dissolved the Jewish scientist's Nobel Prize in acid to save it from the Nazis and then reconstituted uh-huh. it to gold. Um, yeah. I said that the substance he used was spiritus vitae, which is not what it was. That means spirit of life. Uh, it was aqua regia, a q u a r e g i a, or which means royal water or the king or right. aqua regis, king, king's water, king's water, which is a mix, a fresh mixture of nitric and hydrochloric acid. Hmm. Okay. So if you ever need to dissolve gold because they're coming to confiscate it, mix nitric <laughs> and whole hydrochloric acid and dissolve it and then just, you know, have it sitting around in a beer stein and don't offer them any. <laughs> no, don't put it in the beer stein because the cops will just drink it. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, hey, do it because then it'll burn the inside of their throat. And then no, you're, no. And you know how hard <laughs> no. your gold, you know how hard no. it would be to reconstitute your gold in that situation? <laughs> Uh, and we're I not know talking, I'm not a chemist. We're not talking about cops. We're talking about Nazi stormtroopers here, and everybody yeah. agrees that it would have been moral to uh, to do things to them. Reminds me of a Jay Z line: "Should have been a chemist because I cook smart." <laughs> what does that mean? He's talking about cooking crack. <laughs> yeah, Since he's so good at cooking it. He says it should have been a chemist. I really like that. Um, that boondocks where they're trying to figure out how to make crack, and they're like, "Man, there's tons of rap songs about it." And they're looking at them, and they're like, "They don't really tell you how to do it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I had a friend that showed me how to cook crack once, but I guess I shouldn't talk about that. No. no. Think, think of the children. In my fantasy land, yeah. Think of the children. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You got anything else here before we play one of several of Nima's new songs? Uh, no, let's uh, let's wrap it up here, B, and um, think about what song we're going to play, and then you, the listener, will just hear the song. So you yeah. won't hear us discussing what song is best for you to hear. You'll just hear it. Um, it'll be one of three things. I'll sort of lay them all out and, and uh, I guess, preface the clip, so to speak. Uh, it'll be either Eat My Nuts, which is a tongue-in-cheek uh, 
takedown of the TSA and how if, if you're going to be grabbing my balls anyway, you might as well just suck them. Um, and then uh, it might be not no crocodile, which references are, are talking about crocodile and the fiends and um, samples a song that we had sampled for a rap song in the Guns and Weed movie, think, but does it does it yeah. a lot better. I like that one. It's like you're mixing it as you go. You're, you're talking about how you're making it. Yeah, that's kind of cool. It's kind of a how-to. Um, uh, or we could do Jack Boots, which was, I think, the first song I had tried to cut for this album, um, which is obviously about the government goons and drones coming to get you. One, of, one the, of those songs you'll hear. And one of them actually has music in it that we used in an ad, too, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's probably Jack Boots. Um, I think it I mean, has the music. Just, I think it's the music we use in the Stateless Sweets one, isn't it? Or maybe, I don't know. We'll see. I hope not. I don't think it's a music we use in an ad. I think it's a music we use for a Freedom Fiends bump. Ah, there you go. All right. Yeah. So here is a song with an indeterminate name, yet by uh, Nima Vidati. There you go. And I think I helped on some of them, too. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Worms. Worms. Peace. Peace. Let's see. Dig through some of this project shit. Let's see if I can find something to sample. Huh. Oh, yeah. That's from that Guns of Weed. Yeah, slow it down. Slow it down. Ah, I remember this. Yeah. Oh, add some kicks. Yeah, that's it. All right. Give it a little snare. There we go. All right. Now we're gonna come in with the icing on the cake. Make it bounce like speed bombs. Nima, make the beat thump. Playback just like beast bombs. So speedy like police guns. Put a little bit of the swerve in my step, and I'll show y'all what the business is. Take a little hit of the weed and get wet, and I make you all my witnesses. Hide them out, ain't gonna kick them out, and show them out like innocent. Serving it concurrent like I just got two life sentences. Ha! Like I caught that she in ass. This shit got more fats than an avocado has. Uh, or is it horse? Damn, I'm lost. Fuck it, I'ma spit just like right after I floss. So real, like some milk bar from the Amish Y'all fake, like that shit you learned in college Telling lies like a politician's promise You get slammed like you're listening to Onyx Ha! They the hair, we the tortoise Whole different animal, you hear it in the chorus It's that dope shit, that you team for You can get a hit, at the feed store You can get lit, you can pop a pill But it's legit, not no fucking deal it's that dope shit that you team for You can get a hit at the feed store You can get lit, you can pop a pill But it's legit, not no fucking deal In Soviet Russia, drug consumes you Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah Yeah they call me Nima V, I'm a man of many hats I carry big guns, fuck itty bitty gas I'm hard as fitty bats, well the soft as titty fat And I'm my own DJ, tell myself to bring it back Girls used to call me Vidati the body Until I ate all the hamburgers at every pool party Still hot though, but skinny, not so I wear a large shirt that says, show me your taco Fuck it, life's for living, all my sins forgiven And nothing is forbidden except, of course, a question Don't go to confession, cause ain't no man can judge it Your wife can ask you questions, but only cause she'll touch it It's that dope shit, that you fiend for You can get a hit you can get lit, you can pop a pill But it's legit, not no fucking deal It's that dope shit, that you team for You can get a hit, at the feed store You can get lit, you can pop a pill But it's legit, not no fucking deal Coming up. This is the Anarchist Triumvirate. <laughs> so it's not gonna rule you. It's just gonna rule. I'm a MC, but not Punjabi. I got these flows bigger than a tsunami. So watch me, cause I got it covered. Bukaki, all over your mother. That's naughty. My mouth is so potty when I party. But if I wanted to, I could sound just like a smarty. But let's not get into it. I'ma say fuck the malarkey. I'd rather be bullshit and sipping Irish latte. Cool whipping skinny pool dipping. Check the freedom fiends bulletin. When I talk the cool, listen. When you lie, only the fools listen. 
like a young Obama I'm just doom hitting, unlike old Obama I don't doom kittens with robotic drone boom missions Or threaten Jonas Brothers with drone dishing If Sasha starts bone kissing, going down like homeless then The young have found their tongue wide off the grown listen No, the grown don't listen This that no shit that you seen for You can get a hit at the beat store You can get lit, you can pop a pill But it's legit Hello, Freedom Fiends. It's your boy, me from the U.S. Get the U.S. out my bloodstream. I own me and that include endorphins. No one won't ask permission and I won't say please. Freedom fans, the fact that I gotta make clear. The Freedom Fiends podcast is covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 license. Do what you want with it and spread it around. Tell two friends, make copies, email it to everyone you know, go on the site and comment. This is a conversation. Every week, we'll have an exciting new episode where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadati weave their own unique take on the way the world works and how to find your place in it. Available from freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at lrn.fm. Subscribe and tell two friends. And remember, the only power they have is the power you allow them. We're not saying the Freedom Fiends are the one true path to anarchist liberation, but it's a good one. If you want to put your voluntarist money where your mouth is, consider making a donation to the Freedom Fiends. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the spinning coin on any post. Then make a one-time gift via PayPal, or set up a monthly contribution of as little as $3. Giving to the Freedom Fiends helps advance education of horizontal liberation throughout the world. The Freedom Fiends. We work hard, so send us some money.